My guest of the day is Ravi Vazir. He is a hospitality and restauranting expert. And his book is uh, something that I was really, really impressed by. Restaurant Startup, A Practical Guide. It's in its third edition. And I said to Ravi over the phone, I said, you know, it's easy for somebody who's aspiring to get into the restaurant business to enjoy this. Or somebody who already has, uh, has an established business to enjoy this. But somebody like me who has no aspirations to do the same uh, and is pretty much a layman also enjoyed it. It was such a breezy read and I want to give him that compliment here face to face. Well done, Ravi. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Rishi. It's d- wonderful to be here. I'm going to start with uh, when you first decided to put pen to paper, or finger to keyboard and write restaurant startup, a practical guide. And a little birdie tells me that initially it was called Showtime. So why the change in title eventually now uh, in its third edition or did it happen earlier? Talk about that. Yes, absolutely. Actually, it's been an exciting journey in this industry and uh, it all started out with uh, problems that I saw around, a lot of confusion uh, when I started up in this industry uh, about making decisions uh, on business, solving problems uh, in businesses and each entrepreneur that I worked with had different styles of addressing that problem and I was most uh, sort of captivated, I'd say, uh, with Uh, the kind of solutions that one could come up with. And first I started writing for myself, actually. I started writing for uh, clarity for myself. And uh, over time, I started sharing these notes uh, that I had made with uh, friends from the industry. And I got a lot of positive responses. And in fact, some people even said I should write a book. And initially, I thought that was a joke. uh, But uh, I, I took it seriously and began writing. And uh, uh, after that, uh, there was no stopping me. I, in fact, uh, used to wake up in the middle of the night and my wife would wonder what I was doing typing away on that keyboard. In fact, both my kids, when they were little, they've been on my knees while I've been typing away. So I think they'll sleep well with uh, the (laughs) typing of the the keyboard. Uh, So, uh, and I think I've been encouraged a lot by people. In fact, uh, when I called it Showtime, that was because it was the show business so I felt that was an appropriate name for it and it was endorsed in those days by captains of industry like A.D. Singh, Jigs Kalra, Rashmi Uday Singh, Shatpi Basu, a lot of well-known names but also a lot of stalwarts and veterans who may not be well-known outside the industry but when everyone gave their blessings to this content I was encouraged to write further and over time I felt that uh, the the name Showtime may be misleading for some people and uh, therefore I changed the name to Restaurant Startup. But you called it Showtime initially because? Uh, because <laughs> it's it's also the show business, you know, like you guys <laughs> in the media. Uh, it's also the show business. And Ravi, there is no business like show business. Absolutely. Like Sinatra, so. <laughs> Absolutely. So the Absolutely. change of name, sorry, you, I interrupted you. Uh, no, not a problem. So, uh, so a practical guide because I felt that Uh, A lot of theoretical stuff uh, goes on and I'm not an academician. Uh, I try and capture practical learnings that I've had in my experiences. And if something works, then I like to put that pen to paper and I like to share that. And and, uh, that's why uh, that's from the kind of feedback that I got that it's practical, it's useful and people can, uh, you know, can really get a heads up and a primer. It's a kind of a primer for people who want to start this business. Uh, so that's why I felt the name would be more appropriate. Out at Amazon.com and all other major sites. Uh, that's yeah? right. That's as right. well as bookstores. Yeah? Uh, not bookstores at this moment. Mm-hmm. Earlier in its earlier avatar, it used to be in bookstores. But it's available on online bookstores uh, and in physical form as well as in Kindle. Wonderful. Restaurant Startup, a practical guide by Ravi Vazi. In more conversation post this Brian Adams. The only thing that looks good on me is Yawa. It's 9.02. He does this thing really well, doesn't he, Brian Adams? The sing-along thing is what I'm talking about. It's 9.04 in the morning. Ravi Vazir has written Restaurant Startup, A Practical Guide. Uh, I highly advocate you picking up this particular book. He's a restauranting and hospitality expert and uh, with uh, over two decades of experience in the restauranting business, he's really the ideal guy to give you a snapshot of what it requires to put out a quality restaurant. Uh, now, it's, it's something that uh, all my friends in food, whether it's a Kunal Vijayka or Rashmi Uday Singh, or, um, you know, so many people who roll in here for interviews talk about that it's so difficult in Mumbai to maintain longevity in a restaurant. People rave about a new place. 
patronize it. And then, you know, come six months down the line, a year, year and a half down the line, sometimes three or four years down the line, they conveniently forget and move on to the next place. However, there are other startling examples of joints which have been open in Mumbai as well as outside uh, for over half a century. How can one maintain longevity uh, and ensure that year after year you provide quality? What, would you, what is your advice to restaurant startups? Let's talk about that. Absolutely, uh, Rishikesh, you're quite right. In fact, the restaurant business is something which is uh, a business with the least survival rate in the world. And uh, to maintain it, sometimes even the most experienced people can fail. Uh, but I think a couple of things, uh, if, if one can do consciously, uh, then you're pointing true north in terms of uh, uh, you know, what you need to do for this business. And of course, the first thing is food. And you need to maintain your quality. Uh, but even before that, if I serve you tasty food, uh, Rishikesh, I, uh, even before that, I need to give you food that is safe. And that's particularly relevant nowadays. So uh, food that is safety, taste, good value for money. And I'm constantly innovating and showing you that I care because I listen to what you as the consumer want. And at certain times, you may not be able to articulate what you want. As a guest, I need to preempt what you might want uh, through, uh, you know, travels, through innovation in food. But it's not only food. In fact, this business, strangely, is not called just the food business, but it's called the people business. So there's a lot of uh, people relationships that one needs to maintain. And I'm not only speaking about uh, my guests, the, the customers that you have in restaurants. Uh, I'm also talking about the teams that we work with. In fact, I'd say some of uh, the greatest successes that I've had in restaurants or that restaurants uh, have in the marketplace is because they treat their people well. And not just their customers, their teams, uh, their vendors, uh, everyone who's interacting with that business is most important. And, uh, you know, egos sometimes flare up, agendas are different and crossed on certain occasions and trying to match that. And then, of course, you have the licensing agencies who can make your life miserable, uh, as you which we are going of. to come to later in okay, the show. Okay. So, uh, you also said that there was a, an interesting article that you recently wrote where you quoted certain establishments who have been able to break that trend and survive. So obviously, there's a, there's a, there's a secret to that, yes. uh, which uh, who better than you to unveil that? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I just wrote this article a couple of days back uh, for a business website called Domain B. And uh, that was about a secret longing to start or own a restaurant. Uh, you know, one in every five or ten people I meet, uh, when I tell them what I do for a living, uh, they share with me their secret of starting off a restaurant someday. And I realize that there are so many people from different backgrounds that are interested in this field. Uh, and want to start up but don't realize what is important and there's a lot of time and energy that goes into this it's it is glamorous in some ways it's most rewarding in terms of uh, you know people acknowledging your work it's it's something food is a very sensitive thing you're putting it into your mouth and uh, obviously people are very particular about what they put into their mouths and uh, so uh, so one needs to be uh, one needs to be uh, sensitive about these things but that article is specifically about what makes a restaurant tick. And there was another one that I wrote for DNA Money a long time back, uh, which uh, also reveals a formula that I've come up with for success in this business, uh, which is also in my book. It seems very simplistic if you go through that formula that I've written, uh, but actually it captures some of the most complicated parts of this business. And, and the dynamics are quite uh, uh, wild in this business, whether it's money, people, uh, food, uh, you know, the perishability of time. If, if I don't sell, uh, you know, the, the chairs that I have uh, within the working hours of that business uh, and I don't have enough occupancy in that restaurant, uh, then it may die. And, and uh, you know, many, uh, many people, and not just lay people, sometimes people who are uh, from the industry, make the mistake of saying, wow, this restaurant is buzzing with activity uh, and why did it shut down? And then I tell them, look, you went on a Saturday night or a Sunday when, uh, when the best fun is happening, but did you go on a weekday? Did you go at lunchtime and did you see that it was empty at that time? And these guys need to pay all their costs of rent and uh, labor and electricity, which are a couple of the highest costs that there are in this business. 
and uh, they aren't able to cover those costs and 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 very often you lose money on it so there has to be uh you know you have to have an emotional resilience as well as a restorator uh, to be able to uh, tide over uh, these bad times and preferably uh, tie up with people not just financially who can help you absorb that uh, but also people who can share uh, these challenges with you wonderful messages and back with ravi vazir a restaurant startup a practical a guide is available on all online bookstores uh, natasha kobri is going to come in and do some pictures of ravi and we're going to put them up on twitter as well as facebook please ask questions one space you query and name to 53650 over sms on twitter as well as facebook if you search for hri as h i k a y i'll pop up and you can ask facebook.com/radio1.mum is our official page like the page and when you see pictures of ravi right under you can uh, post questions or just inbox us or post on the timeline i'll bring it up see you in a bit madonna express yourself it's actually a regular one in all of her concerts uh, concerts ravi vazir at the back of his book says do you dream of starting your own restaurant <laughs> And really, that's what it's all about. The restaurant startup, a practical guide in his third edition, and Ravi, the restauranting and hospitality expert, is here in studio. Wonderful conversation. This is Good Morning Mumbai, and you're with Rishi K. Radio One. So many people have have walked in here and talked, uh, uh, you know, the food business. Uh, some of them very wise, like Mr. Barrett. Uh, some of them extremely sharp, like Pradeep Shetty. All of all of whom you know. Yeah. Uh, and they've always talked about licenses. Even the events and activations guys come in and you know complain about licenses, justifiably so. You know whether it's a it's a, a Viraf from Wishcraft or Brian Tellis from Fountainhead uh, or Owen and Gang uh, from uh, uh, from F- Fountainhead and uh, the Mindra Blue Show and all of that. But nobody's actually done what you've done, which is put down a list of actual permissions and licenses needed. for a restaurant to start up and i think that is spectacular down to the nitty gritties of which department one needs to go to uh, either in the municipal corporation or el- or elsewhere so talk of a little bit about those few- i mean it is laborious isn't it absolutely rishikesh uh, you took the words right out of my mouth uh, i think licensing in our country is like water you're trying to grasp water and and it's going to kind of fall through and slip through between your fingers and uh, and that's the trickiest part but but if you look at licensing at the core there are a couple of things which are quite logical uh, that people are asking for uh, so you have the municipality where uh, you know they have a health uh, a health department uh, which kind of endorses the quality of food that you're giving they take samples of your food and water and they give you a health certificate which allows you to serve uh, and cook food on the premises uh then uh you have uh, now from the from the center you also have the FSSAI which is the Food Safety Standards Association of India and uh, what they're trying to do is set the standards of uh, food safety in India uh you know right down from the uh, from the vada pav wala on the street to a most sophisticated uh, fine dining restaurant like the Olive Bar and Kitchen uh you need to have uh a certain method of handling food so that it's safe for your end user so they give you a set of guidelines which are quite international and 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 good to go uh there's also uh the fire department uh, you know when you cook food you have stoves and uh, there's a threat of uh, of a fire uh, uh you know uh, naturally uh, and therefore you need to have uh, an exit at the back door you need to have your gas uh, cylinders a uh, banked in a certain way which is uh, safe uh, and and you know uh, the back door allows exit in case of an emergency and then you have the police uh, who uh, give you permission uh, to operate uh, at certain timings because it has to do with the law you're parking on the street uh, you may be blocking uh, people uh, you may be uh, you know putting on music loud which is disturbing the neighbors so they need to keep a control over the law so at the very core uh many of these licenses are very logical and necessary i feel uh to for a restaurant to be in harmony with society uh however uh as we know uh you know a lot of the authorities have uh you know find ways uh to extract money out of to or, make life dif- difficult for you completely yeah. completely in fact that's I'd, i'd say one of the biggest banes in our industry and what i feel is 
since that is the way we work in our country uh, rather than uh, while i would love to have uh, you know a better mechanism to uh, and a, and a one window uh, you know solution for this in terms of licensing that might take a while how, how far away from that i mean uh, successive governments come into power and promise that you know a single window yeah in fact uh, in fact a year or two years back i think i was attending a, a conference uh, of the nrai that's the national restaurant association of india and they had brought in a, a minister uh who promised that within a month or two back then uh, that they would have a one window solution for licenses but obviously they don't want that in fact they they specifically don't want that because it will stop their additional income so what i feel is that you know once upon a time uh, if you were a neighbor uh, you know at my restaurant and i was blasting music or or disturbing you by parking my car in any way i could uh, uh, you know i could uh, tell you do whatever you like because i've sorted out the authorities uh, but nowadays i think uh, you know the 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 neighborhood is empowered with the rti act and and things are getting more transparent yep. and that's a good thing uh, because uh, we can't uh, you know restrators shouldn't be getting into issues with the neighborhood uh, we need to work in harmony with them but at the same time uh licensing authorities uh we need to work with even if we've got all our paperwork in place uh you know there's still some speed money going in to get things done faster because they take their own sweet time and that costs restrators money and and they know that so uh so that's why it's uh, speed money becomes quite necessary couple of questions which we're going to take after the song rakesh ajbani says please ask ravi what's his advice to somebody who wants to start a food business but is not from the food industry which is what this wonderful book is about and he's going to come to that uh, we were just discussing that off the bike uh, before you <laughs> asked that question ice cream man katens about why are food trucks not as popular in india uh, question mark regulation we're going to come to that it's constant craving kedi lang Ravi was here the restauranting and uh, hospitality expert is here Seema was here your wife absolutely <laughs> she says hi on twitter <laughs> oh my gosh okay <laughs> lovely kedi lang poster girl for the lgbt community uh, community in uh, in the west and around the world constant craving is what you just heard 929 in the morning ravi was here um a restaurant guide a practical startup uh, is a book that i thoroughly enjoyed reading and we're talking about that okay rakesh ajbani please ask ravi what's his advice to somebody who wants to start a food business but is not from the food industry thanks everybody feels they can do food uh, film stars cricketers <laughs> you me because we grew up on our mums cooking yeah. and then you know maybe we can make a few you know a few things a noodle whip an egg everybody has an opinion on food but the proper way to go about it yeah absolutely rishikesh uh, uh, you 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 hit the nail on the head uh, in fact i think uh, because as we cook food at home as indians most of the time i think uh, we believe that uh, we can do this ourselves and honestly when i ran my own uh, catering business back then i wish i had known some of the things i had written myself in this book back then uh, because there are so many pitfalls there are so many risks in this business uh, that you need to work with someone who understands the business and honestly there's no way around that you can you can read all you want and that's a primer uh, that gives you an idea how to uh, you know what to expect but beyond that what you also need to do is work with people who understand this business hire a consultant hire professionals have the willingness to make a budget for that and pay money for that because that is going to save you a lot of painful mistakes otherwise you will land up taking more time and therefore more money by doing it yourself and there's Penny no wise such... pound foolish yeah exactly there's no, there's no such thing as foolproof uh, uh, rishikesh i must tell you that that there's no guarantees that if a professional uh, or if even a very accomplished person with great intentions in this industry uh, works with you that you will succeed for sure there's no such thing as a 100% certainty in this business but what you will do is all the risks will be highlighted uh, ways to mitigate those risks will be highlighted and the person can work with you these people can work with you and let you know that these are the practical problems these are the practical solutions and this is how we could go about it eventually the choice is yours as an entrepreneur how to allocate your resources who to work with 
and and uh, you know you may say you don't have the budget but exactly like you said it lands up being penny wise pound foolish correct so basically rakesh get a uh, uh, restauranting consultant uh, you know to do the job for you ice cream man kitchens why are food trucks not as popular in india question mark regulation is what he asks hmm. uh, yes completely right it is regulation i wish uh, we could have far more food trucks because there is a great demand for it and there are some wonderful entrepreneurs with great ideas that i've heard who are raring to go all across the country i believe in bangalore we have quite a few food trucks uh, but here in mumbai i think regulation a long time back uh, at nariman point uh there used to be some food trucks of course I and and yeah. and you know what these guys used to do actually was they used to puncture their own uh, uh, tires and park themselves there for their own convenience and so the authorities said you know this is municipal property you got to pay for this mm. and and uh, you know so they eventually said no let's push it all out because in mumbai every inch of property is is uh, is valuable that's an interesting thing about the tire puncture would never have known anjaneya mishra Hi, how similar is the food delivery business from your traditional dine-in? And you talk about that in the book, you know, about uh, home delivery yes. as opposed to just a traditional dine-in as an add-on. Yes. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. So, so nowadays there are a couple of businesses which have uh, have uh, you know dining dine-in restaurants have also added on home deliveries, and nowadays there are also some businesses uh, which only focus on delivery. and the best part is that this is a great time to be in the delivery aspect of the business because you don't need to set up your own infrastructure you don't need to buy your own bikes if you don't want to you don't need to buy your own uh, you know bike riders if you want to uh, you have uh, websites or web portals which will do that for you so there's something like uh, like hola chef or there's tiny owl and there's so many others where if i am an individual chef from my home not just a restaurant of course from a restaurant as well and i don't want to invest or don't have the bandwidth to put in a delivery network these people do it for me they deliver they collect the food from me they deliver it to my customers in fact they even market me with my uh with my uh menus and uh, uh they collect the money and they give me the money so that that saves me an entire amount of investment in time and money and and it's a great time to uh, to deliver stuff because there are ready made infrastructures you can just plug and play wonderful 934 live back with ravi wazir in just a bit hri as it i k y on twitter and as well as facebook ask questions facebook.com/radio1.mum like the page post on the timeline or inbox us one space query and name to 53 650 Little L by Jamiro Choir when it's food you always get reactions don't you <laughs> Ravi Wazir the restauranting and hospitality expert has written restaurant startup a practical guide I thoroughly enjoyed reading it it's available on all major online stores including Amazon right? that's right for conversation this is good morning mumbai and you're with rishi k manuela on twitter hey uh, rishi k and ravi wazir how difficult is it to open something like a 711 in india for people with a flexible schedule it will be a great help you know it's it's fantastic i mean i've come out of uh, places in manchester uh, nightclubs or a friend's house at 2 2:30 in the morning and I've gone into a 7-11 store and picked up a sandwich I mean uh, and it would be superb a superlative to have something like that in India the impediments uh, and you know the authorities and politicians in particular have been talking about 24 by 7 zones right. entertainment zones food zones how far are we from that and eventually if the permissions were to be granted yes. what are the operational issues let's talk about both fronts sure sure uh, so manuela you're absolutely right uh that it would be fantastic from a from a uh, from an end user point of view from from our guests point of view uh to start something like this because uh you know we have everything from call centers to people who working at airports and various places or you know all the time and uh, it would really be fantastic if the government uh if the authorities uh, really granted those permissions and more importantly gave us zones in which uh, these uh, places could be run because what happens is uh, very often if you are in a residential area and you start this uh, you know late night movement of uh, people uh, can affect the neighborhood 
uh, and 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 it would really upset them and and so we need to have uh, special zones for that uh, where we're not disturbing the neighborhood and uh, if permissions are indeed granted and we can overcome that licensing whenever that happens uh, then yes we have to deal with the operational challenges and which means you see the restaurant business is not something which is just about hiring uh, more people and having more shifts uh, it's about support of people uh, you know services so for instance uh, we need support from vendors uh, you know which may be uh, right now they may work uh, 9 to 5 or or uh, so they need to extend themselves to match that 24 hour cycle uh, we have uh, you know, uh, uh, customers, you know, are they going to be frequent enough? So maybe you need to close down a part of that operation because you can't let your entire electricity on that entire space be running uh, and you just have a handful of customers. So I think uh, it's it's very doable. I think it's it's the future, hopefully. Uh, and, and if uh, the authorities do grant us that permission, it would be fantastic, I think, uh, Mumbai City. It's about time. Let's talk about ownership and funding in restauranting startups, which is really the biggest bane uh, if you're running into a problem. And what are the kind of, uh, of structures that you've seen in the business? Uh, yes. Uh, so ownership is, uh, is something which in the business world uh, means... Uh, you know, taking charge and taking responsibility for certain areas of the business. And and one can do that in various formats. Uh, you could have a CEO of a company or a restaurant manager of your company uh, who you uh, who you give charge to, you give ownership to, and you say, look, I'm not going to be present uh, that much. You take care of this and I'm going to compensate you uh, for your sweat. So that's sweat equity. That's That's one way of doing it. Uh, you have some people who maybe, uh, if your operation is large enough, uh, who you could pay for their intellectual property. So you have in larger companies an independent director uh, who could help guide you. Or in a smaller individual unit, you just have uh, maybe an advisor or a consultant for an interim period of time, not necessarily permanently. So there are all kinds of ownerships. Uh, you know, uh, some people take ownership for uh, the financial investment. Some people take ownership of the expertise that goes into it. Some people are simply allocating their time. So it's all kinds of ownership uh, that goes into this business. You've also said sometimes you need to incentivize chefs to make yes. them feel part of the establishment. Yes. And it is, it's quite a practice in the industry to turn around and say that, you know, I will give you a percentage of the profits yes. or a bit of equity yes. or, uh, you know, um, some kind of an incentive scream. Yes. It happens yes. with the chefs, yes. don't they? Because yes. they, they're the spine of the business. Completely, completely. It's, uh, it's the chefs and in certain cases, the business heads as well. Uh, because that is indeed, like you said, the spine of the business. Uh, you know, uh, restorators need to work on the business, whereas these people work in the business. And uh, what uh, what one needs to always remember is that however good you are in marketing your restaurant, however good you are, uh, uh, you know, in, in selling uh, what you have to sell, uh, at the end of the day, you need to deliver day on day with each transaction with every customer and there's always a chance that there's some lapse in that service some lapse in that food and uh, and in that sense there's an element of risk with every uh, dish that you that you dish out uh, and and therefore uh, recognizing that uh, you draw in the uh, investment the real intrinsic investment of a chef or a restaurant manager or your business heads, your CEO, whatever it is, uh, by uh, incentivizing them with money, uh, that that definitely is a great help to to bring them in and make them feel a part of the business. Radhika Batrasha, your friend, uh, your buddy says hi to you. Uh, hi, delicious hi. <laughs> uh, hi, Radhika. Hi. Kali Ray Jepsen, call me maybe. It's 9.48. I'm in conversation with Ravi Vazir. Call Me Maybe, a restaurant startup, a practical guide. This wonderful book by Ravi Wazir, where he's talked about really the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritties 
um, of the restaurant business. Let's not uh, talk about some some fun stuff. Restaurant okay. jargon. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, you know I, I used to always wonder saying, what is this packs thing, man? Okay. Yeah, my friends in the restaurant business, they have five packs and 10 packs and 15 <laughs> packs. And now the, the uh, travel guys have also started doing that. <laughs> uh, no, in fact, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, they started doing that first. first is it? Yeah, See, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's yeah, why you're yeah, the expert yeah, here. Yeah. So talk about some, some interesting terminologies, which you've actually mentioned in the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, in fact, this section uh, was something that uh, a lot of people wrote back uh, to kind of uh, you know demystify some of this jargon and uh, and and so uh, this part of the book is free on my on my website you know the jargon part give of out it. the website give out and the website. it's it's ravivazir.com www.ravivazir.com now ravi wazir the wazir is a w please so don't yeah. spell it with v a z i r yeah continue yeah absolutely so uh, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, so so this kind of demystifies it, and I find that across the world there's some things which are common, and some things which are not uh, that common. Uh, so some of the stuff is is heavy uh, stuff, but if if you say you know an item is eighty sixth, uh, so that means it's it's out, it's it's locked out, uh, which means that that item is finished, it's on the menu, but we can't sell it anymore because we have no portions of food left to serve the guest, uh, or. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a simple thing like a la carte, everybody speaks about, mm. which is something which you, uh, you know, which you order each dish. But there's something which is correspondingly different, table d'hote, which is uh, like uh, a fixed menu, uh, which you have. And, and some of it is interesting. Uh, some of it is funny. Roll uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite interesting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Roll up is silverware wrapped in a napkin, which may be either linen or paper. That's nice. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> An LDA. <laughs> Legal drinking age. This is really the fun part, which is the appendix, which is restaurant terminology. Yes. NCNS, a no call, no show by an employee <laughs> who goes on an unauthorized absence from work without notifying his employer. You sure. restaurant guys really have your own terminology, don't you? You can have an entire conversation without us finding out stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah it's, it's there's another very important thing uh, about how much you need to budget for space okay in terms of back-end space yes. for lockers and for staff as yes. opposed to space for your covers your covers again is a terminology you've got to explain correct correct okay so, so, so to start, start with uh, covers are basically a space for one individual guest at a table. So that includes uh, a table space, uh, which has possibly a placemat, or even if it doesn't, it's got a, you know, your, your spoon to your right and the fork to your left. You can just imagine that little space. Uh, and, and also the seat uh, that one guest sits on, that comprises one cover. So now, when you allocate space for a restaurant, you speak in terms of covers or the number of people that you're going to be catering to at any given time, the maximum number that can fit into your restaurant. But that's like you rightly said, the front of the house, uh, which mostly guests can see. But the back of the house, as you've rightly pointed out, is a very, very crucial part of the operation because without that, the front of the house cannot be served. And the back of the house includes not just an office space for administrative work, but most importantly, the kitchen and the stores. Uh, you know, you have stores which have uh, three sections. You have uh, dry stores, which is typically at, at room temperature, you know, items from disposables uh, to your groceries. You have refrigerated items like uh, vegetables uh, or fruit, for instance. And uh, you have, uh, you know, the, the items in the freezer, uh, which is your meats and other frozen goods. So you need to allocate stuff for all of this because... Uh, Everything that, uh, including the staff, like you said, you need to have a rest area or if not within your premises, find a nearby place, which may not be at the same rate per square foot, at a lower rate per square foot if you find your rentals are too high. But do give sp your staff some place to rest and to eat, uh, you know, at, at leisure. Because when you're feeding somebody, mm -hmm. you can get really hungry. Imagine I'm serving you, but before that, uh, you know, you need to feed your team before they in turn serve their guests and they need to rest because it's very long hours at work sometimes a break shift which is like spread over 12 hours and with a four hour gap in between and they can't really go home in those four hours so we need to take care of our team and we need to 
uh, you know, uh, look after their needs as well. Puneet Tripathi, hi Ravi, how difficult is it to get the various licenses and what are those in terms of cost? Uh, Puneet, he actually gave out about six or seven of those licenses. In total, how many would there be? As of now, they keep changing, I know. Yeah, uh, so, so that's a very difficult r- roughly, question roughly to, how many? to answer. There's certainly over a dozen uh, okay, about 12 or 13 of uh, them. Licenses, uh, maybe more. Some people say 20. It depends on what exactly you want to do. So, for example, mm. if you want to play uh, music uh, in, in your restaurant or you want to have a live band in your restaurant, there's something called a PPL license. Phonographic performance license. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and uh, then there is also, if you want liquor, there's an entirely new range of licenses. It used to be something near 2 lakhs, but now it's almost 5 lakhs, isn't it? They would plan to change that. No, no, for like all liquor, uh, mm. you are referring to uh, under the table or, or <laughs> otherwise? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know about under that. the table. Uh, but I'm just saying roughly, like, like a, a small thing like a, a dancing license, you yes. know, an entertainment area. And yes. It could, could, could range from anything from 10,000 and above, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. And these are all absolutely. yearly costs. Uh, completely. Yearly completely. costs, yeah. All, all uh, per year. Mm. So, so actually his book has a, a lot of numbers there. Yeah. So just pick up Restaurant gra- uh, Startup, A Practical Guide by Ravi Vazir. Uh, earlier on in the show, he talked about six of those licenses. And he's just added a few more fleetingly. So Puneet, you've got to do that. Also, a very interesting question from Shripad Bharati, what we're going to take after the messages, which is the last uh, leg with Ravi Vazir. Uh, two questions to Ravi. Uh, to Ravi. What's your uh, take on potential for QSR for Indian food as opposed to burgers, pizzas? Secondly, what should be typical operational break-even period for a snacks restaurant? Interesting. So we're going to come back to that. Last leg of conversation with Ravi and uh, more pictures of him. H-R-I-S-H-I-K-Y on Twitter as well as Facebook and facebook.com slash radio1.mum. Uh, questions on those platforms are welcome. One space your query and name to 53650 on the SMS line. See you in a bit. 94.3 Shanish, I love your smile. Ravi was here with his beaming smile. The restauranting and hospitality expert, Restaurant Startup, a practical guide, is uh, in its third edition. Wonderful book to pick up, available at all online stores. We're talking about the book and beyond. Question on Facebook from Shripad Bharati. This is Good Morning Mumbai, and you're with Rishi K. Radio 1. Two questions to Ravi. Shripad says, what's your take on potential for QSR for Indian food? as opposed to burgers and pizzas. We're going to come to second part later. What's QSR? <laughs> yes, uh, QSR is a quick service restaurant. Uh, and, and that's a very uh, important question. I'd say Indian QSRs, uh, it's absolutely the time for them. Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't have to wait for uh, private equity investors to go berserk uh, about uh, this business of uh, QSRs, you know, uh, QSRs have been the poster boys for uh, private equity investors since quite some time uh, and and with good reason. Uh, But QSRs, Indian QSRs have existed for the longest time. Uh, Whether uh, you look at, uh, uh, you know, a 52 year old restaurant like Swati Snacks, that's an example of a QSR, an Indian QSR, successful over more than 50 years. Uh, There are many, many such restaurants across the country. Uh, there's uh, Koshi's uh, in Bangalore. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, so so many restaurants like uh, MTR uh, also in Bangalore. Uh, so go so, for it, buddy. So uh, <laughs> absolutely, uh, uh, yeah. If that's your that's your area of investment, uh, choose your mix of products that you want to sell, and absolutely uh, uh, go for it. Secondly, what should be a typical operational break-even period for a snacks restaurant? For a snacks restaurant. Okay. Talk about that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, an operational break-even is something which uh, is very elusive uh, for uh, for most people. And it's not easy to give a straight answer for that in a figure if one wants to be really honest. Uh, the reason for that is because you can choose uh, certain aspects of your costs and certain aspects you can't. Uh, you may decide that I'm going to go for a small format place so you know what your rents are, what your fixed costs are uh, in terms of manpower, electricity and all of that. But you can actually choose what your food cost is going to be. So, for example, if you say food cost is uh, normally, say, 25%, and so I have to sell at 100 rupees if my food cost is 25, uh, I might say, no, I want to change my food cost. I don't mind a higher food cost because I want to garner more footfalls, more traffic, more people. And so I will not sell at 100 rupees. I will sell at 80 or 90 rupees. So my food cost goes higher, 
my profit goes lower and my break even goes a little further away but i am able to build my brand in the initial stage if that's your choice and therefore instead of say uh one and a half year that i was targeting at i don't mind if it takes me 3 years to break even so a a significant part of that may be in your control but remember when you project financials before ever having uh or before ever starting uh your restaurant uh you can't predict how it's going to be so for example if you've started one qsr or any restaurant for that matter in one location and your brand is successful and it took you say 2 years to break even it does not mean that if you start the same qsr the same brand in another location that it will take you 2 years it may take you less it may take you more or you may even find that that rest that particular outlet is losing money so there's no such thing if someone tells you that look your break even should be this much i'd i'd request you to approach that with a little caution uh, because there's no certainty of saying that so one and a half years yes is a nice time two years is a nice time some industry experts feel three years is a safe time to uh, to look at uh, but so somewhere broadly between one and a half to three years maybe a, a you know broadly a nice time to break even wonderful conversation thank you so much for your time and before you go where people can get in touch with you your website as well as your email id just go slow on that yeah <laughs> uh, yes my website is www.ravivazir.com that's w uh a z i r and my email address is ravivazir@gmail.com have yourself a good day yeah it's Bye. been a pleasure thank you rishi ab ahead photographer girish mistri on the phone he's uh, really devoted his life to education and uh, we're going to have a conversation with him kid rock born 